So we've spent some time so far, if, if we kind of take stock of where we've, from where we've come, uh, then I think this figure epitomizes what we've done. So you recall when we started out on this, we talked about two different uh, components that we'd uh, be interested in understanding. Those were fluids that were denser than water and fluids that were lighter than water, and neither of which would readily mix. They're not miscible, they were immiscible. Uh, and their behavior we used uh, would be different based on their characteristics. The denser ones would sink in water, just like they would in a swimming pool. And we wondered about what the conditions would be whereby they would stop. And we talked about capillary barriers and how those capillary barriers relate to um, permeability. Not the permeability is stopping it, but it's because permeability is related to pore size and capillary behavior is also related to pore size that they get stopped there. We also figured out that those that are lighter than water wouldn't sink below the water table. They get buoyed by the water table, and they would sit above it in a lens. Uh, we talked about the architecture of these, both in the subsurface below the water table here, and maybe partly below the water table, depressing the water table here. And we divided our efforts into a couple of areas, and we're tackling the third of those areas today. So the couple of areas were that in the first few weeks or months, it would travel based on this balance between gravity and meniscus forces, which are the two forces that control where it goes. And its final uh, architecture would depend on that condition. We talked about capillary pressure versus saturation curves. Uh, we talked about the fact that we'd end up with a, a chimney in the Vado zone and also a chimney in the, the saturated zone, coupled with lenses uh, for Dean apples, and a chimney in the Vado zone, and a lens sitting on top of the water table for Elm apples. We talked about how, if we wanted to suck them out, the rate at which we could do that was then controlled by multiphase flow, and that was epitomized by Darcy's law and relative permeabilities, uh, and that controls the behavior in the free phase, as separate phases. Stuff within the pores as TCE, and water, and maybe air, but ostensibly separate from each other and not interacting very much. The second stage was to look at what happens if they're set up in this architecture and you have stuff either flowing through the Vado zone, which we've talked about exclusively so far, uh, sorry, the, the groundwater zone, uh, which we talked exclusively so far. And we made the case that we could represent this by an equivalent behavior whereby we look at stuff being carried down a piece of a core plug and we'd have some plume which would give us a concentration uh, which travels down, down gradient as a, a plug flow. We talked about where that was true, that we could estimate where the this... Um, front would be after a given time, uh, and what the um, uh, limitations of those simple estimates were. Uh, we spent some time doing that. We talked about what happens when these uh, aqueous components that get dissolved from the static behavior get carried downstream, and whether they are either conserved, they're conserved within the porous medium, that they Everything that starts off going into the aqueous phase stays in the aqueous phase, in which case the concentrations will be the maximum and the velocity downstream will be the maximum also, or the case where it's uh, attenuated by sorption. And in that case, then, the attenuation both reduces the concentration because it takes some of it onto the, onto the static substrate, and it also reduces the rate at which it travels downstream because of that chromatographic separation, as we called it. And so that was the behavior that we talked about in the saturated groundwater zone below the table. In each case, the source of this was this free phase material, which was present either at almost 100% saturation or at saturations that may be a few percent to 50 or 60 or 70 or 80%, in which case, in the groundwater regime, this would diffuse 
to be able to be then carried downstream, which is the last thing we talked about uh, in the previous class. Or in the case that we have a chimney that actually goes through the groundwater regime, then clearly the water can flow through this chimney and uh, dissolve the material as it goes downstream and make a, a plume, which is really being shown here. So those are the two things we've talked about. The first um, two months, free phase in the architecture that it sits in in terms of a free phase, and then everything else after that in which it gets dissolved, carried downstream, it may sorb and be attenuated, but essentially we can calculate what the concentrations would be. All of that second part has been isolated only to the groundwater region. And so today what we'll do is we'll talk about what happens in the part above the groundwater regime, the Vado zone, where we can get this region where there could be free product that sits here, and there could also be a chimney that exists uh, linking the, the surface down to the bottom. So in either case. And so that's what uh, we wanted to, I wanted to talk about today. That's where we were. Let's do red. I like red. Okay. So these are the things we'll talk about. We'll talk about uh, transport mechanisms, which are by two mechanisms, by both diffusion and by advection, aqueous advection. And we'll talk about um, the analogous process for retardation in um, groundwater systems, which is sorption onto the solid, uh, and also in the case of vapor transport, sorption into an immobile fluid in the Vado zone, which is water, which is the partitioning part, and the result of that in terms of retardation. So those are the, the things that we we'll Yeah, that's actually not a bad conceptual picture. So this is the, the picture. We have stuff that's spilled. It may exist as free product, or it may exist as a smear in this chimney. Uh, but irrespective, we're above the, the water table. Um, there is a continuous phase of air, so that the air at this point is connected to the air at this point continuously. Um, because it's not occluded by liquid, uh, in partial saturation that exists there, water in partial saturation. And so the mechanisms that you could imagine that could happen would be by diffusion in air as a stagnant air phase with this stuff being carried from a high concentration gradient here to being further away. It could be advection because the vapors from this may be more dense than the vapors from the air. And so you could imagine that density might allow it to spread. And we can also imagine that in this system, in a dynamic way, water could be coming in through the top through rainfall, infiltration from rainfall. In which case, you can imagine that that would, oops, would wash this stuff out and carry it down to the groundwater table, in which case it can be infected by the kind of mechanisms that we've talked about already about flow in the groundwater table, below the groundwater table. So those are the, the, the kinds of behaviors that we're we're talking about. And this is the kind of geometry that we're going to deal with. And so if you imagine these transport mechanisms, we'll kind of divide them up into um, two, really. You could imagine that it diffuses in the vapor phase, so it off-gasses. Stuff that's in the liquid phase boils at 55 degrees Fahrenheit in the ground because it's volatile because they're volatile substances. And because the concentration in gas of that component, methane, TCE, whatever it is, is higher close to here than it is further away here, Fick's law drives diffusion and it spreads. So that's one mechanism. The other mechanism, which we won't deal with, uh, but you could imagine, the same process, but instead of just diffusion, if the vapors that volatilize or denser than the air that sits here, just as you can imagine this in a room, dense vapors falling out of a beaker, they would go down and they'd sit on the floor. This would be, again, a mechanism by which it could be driven within the subsurface. And of course, as soon as it contacts the water table, then it can 
interact with the water. The stuff that is in the vapor phase can be dissolved and solubilized into the water and then can be carried off by the advective motion of groundwater. So not so different from this. The other one, which turns out to be a much more uh, insidious one much and have much larger effect, is due to infiltration. And so in this case, what happens is you rain on the surface, a certain amount of water infiltrates these blue, <coughs> blue lines here. Some of it will go through the partially saturated, partially napple saturated chimney, and it will dissolve portions of that, and it will carry the dissolved phase down to the water table, hits the water table as water, and then may then will get dissolved in the in the water just because it's coming in as dissolved phase. It might get diluted, but it will get traveled, it will get transported in the same way as this is getting transported. So those are kind of the uh, the mechanisms. I think, yeah, I just noticed this, this arrow on the bottom says uh, increasing complexity. I was going to say the arrow also kind of represents increasing impact, but I would say this is less impact than this. This is the most impactful, as we'll show ourselves. This is perhaps the least. So this may be first, second, and third. But I think you'll come away with that after we've talked about this uh, for a little bit. So that's the, the, the behavior we're going to talk about. So we're going to spend some time talking about uh, diffusion first, and then we'll spend time talking about infiltration. And actually, the third of your questions in the test will be on this infiltration part, or, or a surrogate for this. So, so it, it'll be right up center. I'm not looking at the previous stuff because we'll go back through that. Um, to cut a long story short, you remember that when we talked about diffusion, I'm just going to talk in terms of um, word pictures, if you like. What we did was we said that if we have a beaker with uh, an ink drop in it, it will diffuse because it hates those concentration gradients. The way that we develop the equations that describe that behavior is we take a continuity equation, mass in equals mass out, and we put into that continuity equation fixed second law, saying that mass fluxes are proportional to the concentration gradient. And that's exactly what we do here, except now what we're looking at is not ink spreading out in water, where the ink is diffusing in water, but now some gas is diffusing in air. So that's the analogous component. So fixed first law, yeah, I guess this is fixed second law. Fixed first law is that a mass flux of gas is driven by a concentration gradient and that concentration gradient drives at a rate given by this term. This is our, if you like, this is what we called before d sub star. And it's a diffusion coefficient of gas in air. And it's modul modulated by the fact that the um, cross-sectional area that it travels across is proportional to the volumetric gas content. <coughs> and so you will remember, I'm not sure. So you can imagine a porous medium that the porosity, if it has two components in it, is going to be equal to the volumetric, uh, the part that's filled with air, plus the parts that's filled with water, if we have two phases. Let's just assume we have two phases. And so these are the only two components that we can have in, in the porosity. We've said that if it's only a single phase system, when the volumetric moisture content goes to a saturation of 100%, it completely fills the porosity, and so this has to equal the porosity. So we're just saying the same thing. But now, in this system, we can have part of the pore space filled with water and part of the pore space filled with gas. But together, they had to add up to the total pore space as a fraction of the total volume, which is what the porosity is, right? Remember, the porosity is equal to the volume of the voids divided by the volume, the total volume, 
I like having a line through my volumes instead of velocities, right? So, and so that's where this comes in. The only part it's flowing through is the gas-filled part, right? Gas is diffusing only through the gas-filled part. If you fill all the, the pore volume up with water, this is zero, and so there is no gas phase diffusion because there is no gas to diffuse. So that, I guess that probably makes sense. If we take this mass flux and put it into continuity equation, then this is the equation we get. And this is the diffusion equation. Haven't really derived it because we pulled out some components, apparently out of a hat, uh, that you'll recognize. And it looks the same as before. Second order with concentration, first order in time, diffusion coefficient, it looks a bit like our advection diffusion equation. You'll remember from before that looked like for concentration in water, retardation, DCDT equals effective longitudinal dispersion, <laughs> D2CDX squared minus advective velocity times concentration with direction. Diffusion or dispersion, advection, accumulation, what the terms represent. There is no term for advection in this, just because the way we der uh, derived it. But remember what we did with this. We divided both sides through by retardation, <coughs> which was useful to us, because all of a sudden it said that our advective velocity, effective advective velocity is now modulated by this retardation coefficient goes slower because this is always bigger than one one or bigger and also the front gets sharpened because this reduces dispersion and so this is kind of what we have here as well so we've, we've seen this before and so we could use the same ideas before is that we could divide both sides of this through by retardation we haven't really said what the retardation coefficient is yet but if that's the case, then we have this is equal to 1, and we have this equation like this. And so we'd expect it would kind of behave the same way. And so that's kind of the entree into this second uh, picture at the bottom. So if you imagine if you take a certain concentration in gas that's volatilized from this plug of liquid that's in the system, and you allow it to run for some time, the concentration will drop as you go away. That's exactly what this picture is showing. The concentration is highest close to the source. As you go some distance x away, it will drop. As you get far enough away, it'll never have felt it yet because it hasn't traveled there. The idea of retardation is exactly the same. Is that if you, but now it's being applied on the, um, the diffusive part that sh which is being driven by the concentration. And so if this is being driven by diffusion, then really what this retardation means is it, it won't have gone so far because some of it is being attached to the static medium. And we'll find out in a minute that the static medium is two parts. It's the grains, which clearly don't move because they're there, but also the water that's present in the Vedo zone, which is held by meniscus forces, doesn't move either. So it's held both in the water and the solid grains because the water isn't moving in that zone. And so that's basically the the idea of, of this equation. So we can imagine that we can represent behavior by uh, diffusion. And it really is diffusion this time. The diffusion is driven by two parameters, an effective diffusion coefficient, and it's retarded by this retardation. So we need to know exactly what those two material properties are and how we get them. The diffusion coefficient comes from taking the value that you'd get from a reference book. So you go to the library, you get a mechanical engineer's textbook, environmental engineer's textbook, environmental systems engineer's textbook, and you look up for the diffusion uh, constant of methane in air. Give you a number. It'll be something times 10 to the minus 9 meters squared per second of that order. But because in going from A to B, it's not going 
through this classroom. It's going through a porous medium, and it has to go this tortuous <laughs> flow path. Then it, we have to modulate in some way. So just in the same way as we did it for liquid diffusion coefficients, we had a, a value which we called omega, I think, which we said was between 1 and 0 0.05, I think, if the numbers, something like that. It doesn't matter what they are, but something that reduces it because it has to go this tortuous flow path, and it reduces it because it has uh, a length that has to travel, which is longer, longer than the, as a crow flies. And there are a variety of expressions that allow you to calculate this tau value. The most uh, well used is Millington and Quirk, 1961. Certainly long before you were born. Almost before I was born, but not quite. <laughs> and it relies on the ratio of the gas content relative to the total porosity. And so the total porosity um, would be, um, yeah. yeah, total porosity, this is porosity. So this is the same as porosity. What are the exponents in the G is for gas, T is for total. No, the exponents. Like the oh, seven thirds, sorry. Okay. Yeah. And on both? Uh, on both? Seven thirds on the top, two on the bottom. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. It's not very clear. Yeah. Even though it's zoomed in, it's not very clear, I agree. And so if you wanted to, uh, you could use that to look at what the, I don't know why it keeps on wanting to blank portions of, of this out. So you could use this to, to use this equation. So in other words, if we know what the value of tau is, we can calculate what this is, which is what we want, because it's what goes into this expression here. And we can do that if we know what this magnitude is and what this is. And so if we know what the value of the gas diffusion coefficient is, oh, I lied, minus 6, not minus 9. This is meters squared per second. Uh, and if you use values of the gas content being 25% high up in the Vado zone to being 0, at the base, then you can just plug numbers into this expression, which has now gone off the reservation, I guess. 7 thirds divided by squared. If you plug numbers for uh, gas content to the 7 over 3 on the top, then you end up with some value of tau, which is this, which gives you an effective gas diffusion co coefficient of 2.6 times 10 to the minus 6. If you use a smaller gas content, you get a smaller tau, which gives you a smaller effective diffusion coefficient. If you go to where the gas coefficient is zero, there is no gas diffusion, then the only mechanism that's driving diffusion in the system is diffusion in the aqueous phase, in which case you'd want to use the same diffusion coefficient that we talked about when we were talking about advection dispersion equations. And so this doesn't come from anywhere except from knowledge of what the dispersion coefficient of TCE in water is. That's exactly what this is, 10 to the minus 9. So that's why I quoted 10 to the minus 9 instead of 10 to the minus 6. I guess it's higher in water, higher in air than it is in water. Okay? So that's the first of the things. So we're trying to figure out exactly what controls uh, the diffusion rate in a physical sense. And we think it's due to the diffusion coefficient of the gas in air and also how retarded it is in terms of this attenuation effect. So what do we know about the retardation part? What we could imagine, uh, you remember that before we talked about distribution coefficients and we talked about the concentration in the aqueous system to the concentration in the solid, which I think we called C star, and doing an experiment that defined that. I can't, can never remember which one is which, but I should know it. 
we defined this distribution KD, uh, which maybe was equal to, certainly on this graph, it would be that KD is equal to the concentration in the water divided by the concentration in the solid. I can't remember whether it was that or the reciprocal of that. It doesn't matter for now. But the basic idea is that if you had a certain concentration in the water, then you get a certain equilibrium concentration on the solid that matched that. If you double the concentration in the water, you double the concentration on the solid. It's an equilibrium system. And for linear isotherm, it's, that's the behavior. You double one, the other one doubles. The behavior that represents that same behavior between the uh, component of the concentration in the gas phase and the water so in other words, if you take up the full saturation of the concentration dissolved in water, the concentration in the gas that will sit on top of that is given by Henry's law. And Henry's law is, is kind of analogous to this. It's the, this, is, this was the ratio of the aqueous to the solid concentrations. This is the ratio of the aqueous, Cw, to the gas concentrations. And so this is what we'll call our non-dimensional, we love non-dimensional stuff. Non-dimensional Henry's law coefficient. It's a e convenient way to think of it, just because it's analogous to this. This wasn't dim non-dimensional, you remember, because the concentrations we had here were in different units. But it was the ratio of those concentrations nonetheless. This is the ratio of those concentrations but it's non-dimensional because we're going to choose these to be the same units. The way that Henry's law is usually quoted, it's the, the ratio of the concentration between the stuff dissolved in water and as a free phase above that water phase. It's still the ratio of the concentrations. But I guess this is a bit like KD in that if the concentration in the gas and the concentration in the water aren't in the same units, then the Henry's law coefficient, which is the ratio of them, has some bizarre units. And it does have bizarre units, which will, they're atmospheres, meters cubed per mole. And the reason for that is that you can think of the gas concentration being also defined as a partial pressure, hence the atmosphere thing here, and the solubility in the water phase being a, a mass per unit volume. And so, if you go and look up in the Environmental Systems Engineer textbook a value for Henry's law coefficient, you'll get H prime. It's much easier for us to think of using H, which is what we'll choose to use. But there, you can convert from one to the other. And I think it's an anal analogy to, to foster, and that is Henry's law coefficient is the ratio of gas to water concentrations. Distribution coefficient is the ratio of solid to liquid concentrations, or the reciprocal can't remember which. Okay? So, that's it. And so, if you imagine um, that we deal with retardation, how much gets taken out of the flow field, it's diffusing happily as a gas, and the only thing that it can do to not diffuse happily as a gas is to go either into the static water or into the grains that are not mobile either. Because of what we've said about water-wet solids, is that we expect that if we have a porous medium, and it's water-wet, that each of the grains of quartz that we have will be completely surrounded by water, this monolayer of water. And if there's extra water to go around, then it will start filling up the pore spaces as well. And if there's gas in here, then that will be present. But the important thing of thinking about this water-wet solid is that if you think about it, the gas, if it resides in this point here, to get into the solid has to first go through the water to get to it. And so usually the way this is thought of is that the route from the gas phase into either the solid or the liquid always occurs in sequence. It goes from the gas into the water and then from the water into the solid. And the convenience, that's reality what it does, but the convenience of thinking about it that way is that we have relationships which already tell us what the equilibrium concentration between the water and the solid should be. 
And we also have relationships that tell us what the equilibrium concentration between the water and the gas would be. So if it goes from the gas into the water, then this should say something about that equilibrium behavior. And then if it goes from this equilibrium concentration in the water, from the gas, then into the solid, then this should say something about what that should be. And so it's probably no great surprise that if you look at the retardation coefficient that describes this behavior, which we're going to call R again, it's equal to 1, as it was before, plus a part that, let's do this part, plus a part that says something about how it goes from the gas into the water, and a part that says how it goes from, once it's in the water, then into the solid. So that's it. So I think that's a useful one. This is such an incredibly logical class. I've never thought about it this way before. It's a revelation to myself. You're benefiting from that. <laughs> Don't want to have such humor? Ever? <laughs> so that's what these components are. So this is our non-dimensional Henry's law coefficient, as is this. This is our distribution coefficient, bulk density aquifer, uh, volumetric gas content, and volumetric water content. And so, so that's entirely logical. So if we know what our Henry's law coefficient is for the particular species, we know what the, okay, the relative um, gas and water contents are, then we can say something about the retardation. Yeah. Why is the Henry's law coefficient included in the um, solid, the water to solid term? Just the way it works out. Um, because, yeah, I don't know. I'll get back to you on that. Yeah. No, just the way it works out. I was going to say, uh, because it has to get into the water first and equally. I guess because, well, yeah, okay, maybe that's what it is. So because we're writing everything in terms of the concentration of the gas, that's what it depends on. So to get from the gas to the water, it relies on Henry's law coefficient. To get from the gas through the water into the solid, it relies on both of them. So I think that's what it is. Has to get through the two two classes. That's that's my my story, and I'm sticking to it. Another revelation. Another revelation. I I should pay you guys to come to turn up the class. You know, I really should. So and and the other things uh, um, carry on from before, and that is that KD we can also get from the organic content only if it's only dependent on the organic content. If it's not, we have to test for KD separately, right? So, so we could use all the other things we talked about last time to do that. Yeah, so I think that's right. So to get into the water, it only has to go from the gas into the water. To get into the solid, it has to go through the water and onto the solid. And the concentration of the water is governed by um, Henry's law coefficient with the gas. Yeah, brilliant. Well, good question. Love it. So we could play around with that um, equation. So if we do that and we assume that we can get uh, this non-dimensional Henry's law coefficient, in this case for TCE, at 20 degrees centigrade, if we have 10% water content and 25 gas content, then that means that our porosity is equal to 35%, right? Which means that our water content would be a saturation of Two-sevenths, is that right? Two-fifths. <coughs> no, two-sevenths, the total. So this is saturation of water is equal to 2 over 7, right? Because 10 plus 25 is 35. Uh, 10 over 35 is two-sevenths. And saturation of gas is going to be uh, should be five sevenths, and they should sum up to 100 percent. Just in case you, you're not quite clear what these moisture contents are, and this means that it's 35 percent porosity. And so what we could do is we could take this value for the Henry's law coefficient, and if I zip up to here, just use this equation, one of which is reciprocal of Henry's law coefficient. Actually, they both are reciprocal of Henry's law coefficient. 
and one of the only one of them varies with KD. And we choose a value of KD that I think we'd used for uh, Borden. I don't know if making this big will make it stop being fuzzy. Yeah. <laughs> My God! <laughs> Sorry. Scaring the Jesus out of us. Um, and we look at the effects of retardation in the gas phase, which will always be the same, right? This is the first term. This is, uh, this is gas to water, and this is gas to water to solid, if you like. This is the second term. So in this case, this will always be the same. So depending on, irrespective of how much organic carbon we have in it, whether it's a uh, hundredth of a percent or whether it's one percent, then this doesn't change. But the magnitude of the stuff that gets sorbed from the gas into the organic carbon is a big number. And so the retardation changes in a big way depending on that. That's, that's all. So in other words, the value would be 1 plus this plus this equals this. This is 1 plus this plus this. Equals this. That's, that's all we're doing. And so this one depends on the, the amount of sorption into the, the solid phase. So just an illustration of, of being able to do the calculation as much as anything. Um, yeah, right. So let's back off a bit. So we, we know how to do retardation. We made this anal analogy before between uh, what would happen if we looked at the gas phase transport, which kind of looks like this, relative to transport in the saturated groundwater zone. If we went to the saturated groundwater zone and we thought about a system that looked like our stuff in the Vado zone, which is diffusing in all directions, but for which some of it has gone below the groundwater table and has a, a little uh, lens sitting here, and there's water that is advecting past here and is carrying it downstream. But let's say that this velocity is zero. So it's got into this region. And you could imagine that it would diffuse in here, in the aqueous part, in the same as it's diffusing here in the gas part. So the same kind of idea applies, is that if you looked at where it should get based on the diffusion coefficient and how far it would go, is if it's retarded in going through here, it would go less far. But the rates at which it would diffuse in the gas phase and the rates at which it would diffuse in the aqueous phase will be different. And the reason for that, I guess we investigated, because we said that it's, if you look in this profile, the gas diffusion coefficient is a relatively small number, 10 to the minus 6. At the water table, in the water, diffusion in the water, is a relatively even smaller number, 10 to the minus 9. So you'd expect it to diffuse much more slowly in the water phase than you would in the gas phase, for starters, if there's no velocity that's carrying it. But if the velocity in the water was zero, and it was just being transported by diffusion only, then what you could do is you could look at the relative magnitudes of the retardation for each of the species that you might have. So say you have a cocktail in the Vado zone, which comprises methane, butane, and uh, TCE. I can't remember what we use later. But if each of these has a different retardation rate because of a Henry's law coefficient for each of those compounds are different, then they'll diffuse at different rates. And so the arrival time at some piezometer for each of these compounds will be different. The one that's least retarded will ar arrive first. The one that's most retarded will arrive last and the one that's uh, intermediate retarded will arrive in the middle. And likewise, that will be the case for the, the groundwater. It won't say anything about how quickly it will arrive, but it will say something about the order in which they'll arrive, just like a uh, filter paper says something about chromatographic separation in terms of which one is traveling faster than the other one. And so, if you take a site, in this particular case, that is contaminated with TCE, TCA, TCE, and 
methyl chloride, and you look at monitoring the arrival times at two locations, one here in the gas phase and one here in the groundwater phase, then the sequence, order of arrival of those, will depend on the inverse retardation coefficient, I guess. The one with the smallest retardation coefficient will arrive first, and the one with the largest will arrive last. So this is the calculation just doing that. Again, not very clear maybe, but you can probably see these. This is organic carbon. This is the distribution coefficient, Kd, which allows us to calculate the aqueous retardation coefficient. So R sub A will be equal to 1 plus Kd times bulk density over uh, volumetric moisture content or porosity, which we've used before. So this is the aqueous, A for aqueous. And the this is Henry's law coefficient. And this is the, the gaseous retardation coefficient. I can't remember what it is. Well, I can try and remember what it is. It's equal to 1 plus 1 over H times two other components plus KD over H, right? Times density over, I'll use porosity. Cut, what's this? This is, these are two different, um, water, moisture, moisture content, and gas content. Theta W, how did that come? Theta G. How did that come? And so the the moral of the story, if we can keep on, is you can calculate the retardation coefficients due to the aqueous phase, and they turn out to be these numbers here. We can calculate the uh, retardation coefficients due to the gas phase, which are these. And so we know that in the aqueous phase, this one will arrive first, then this one, then this one, first, second, third, in groundwater, because this is the least retarded, intermediate, most. And in the gas phase, this one will arrive first because it's the least. Now the, the other one, that's the, the, the next least, if you like, is this, and then this. So they change the order. So instead of being arriving MCE, TCE, and TCA, it arrives this one first, second, and third. So, and that is merely due to the fact that the distribution coefficients, the H values, are the same. We're assuming, of course, actually we're not assuming, we're calculating what the distribution coefficients are for these different compounds, but they don't vary, well, they do actually vary a fair bit. So this is calculated because there are different, different KD values because they're different actual compounds. So these do vary as well. Okay, so that's that. And so an example of that, I guess, also in the notes, is, is basically looking at doing that for three compounds. So this is an experiment, a field experiment, at a, um, a facility at Oregon Graduate Institute. I guess it's uh, OGI. I think it's still called that not Corvallis and not Eugene, it's not Oregon State and it's not uh, University of Oregon. A big concrete box, um, 10 meters on edge and three meters deep. Big box, bigger than this room, 10 me three meters is 10 feet, so a bit taller than this room and certainly a bit bigger than this room. That was back filled with uh, soil and into this soil, a whole bunch of capillary tubes, little stainless steel tubes, were placed in that terminated at each of these points. And then a source of um, methane, butane, and TCE in a nitrogen carrier gas were injected into this sand mixture, partially saturated sand mixture. And these are the concentration contours after... 24 hours <coughs> and after 72 hours for each of these three compounds methane, butane, and TCE. And so this is a snapshot after one day, 
This is a snapshot after two days, three days rather. So you see that after three days it's gone further than one day. It's all being driven by diffusion, just uh, concentration gradients, no natural convection present in the system. And you see that between methane and butane, TCE has gone much less far, both after one day and after three days. And so what's the reason for that? You'd expect it to be because this is more heavily retarded than this. And so that should be represented in the uh, retardation magnitudes. So if you look at the Henry's Law coefficients for these three gases, these dimensionless Henry's Law coefficients, what we've called H, not H prime, then they turn out to be that methane and butane are pretty similar to each other, as indeed were these two, and TCE is much lower. And so when you plug it into this, a low value here means that a retardation factor here becomes much larger, and so it should travel much less far. And so it's entirely consistent with uh, our feeling for this. This has a lower Henry's coefficient, is more highly retarded, and would travel less far. So it's nice when things actually uh, make sense. So it seems that this is useful to us at some level, at least in gas transport, as so long as we can figure out what H is. We've said that H is the ratio of... Um, the gas concentration to the water concentration. I apologize that sometimes I use A for aqueous, which is water, uh, for this, if these are written in the same units. But often, Henry's law coefficient, H prime, is written in terms of a partial pressure of that gas to represent the gas concentration and the concentration of water. And so this no longer is in the same units as this. And so it'd be nice if we could figure out how to convert H prime into H because we're using H in this. And I think H is much more intuitive. And so it's relatively straightforward how we do that. And this kind of two-phase or two-column approach does basically that. This is our definition for Henry's Law written in terms of partial pressure and concentration. Concentration of gas defined as a partial pressure. It's kind of similar to this, but it's not quite. We'd like to get to figure out what this is. So what we could do is we could write the ideal gas law as this. Partial pressure, absolute pressure, density, absolute temperature, uh, universal gas constant, and the molar mass of that particular sub substance. Substitute it into this expression here, and we end up with this. That's what we've done. If we partition this, so substitute here, we get this. If we partition this to take the parts which exist here, then that's all this equation here is, where this part out here is RT. And we notice that this term within the brackets is actually a, uh, by definition, this term here is this. Density of gas divided by its molar weight is actually Cg, and 1 over Cw is this. So this is this, this, this is this. And so all we've done is we've taken out from this expression a part which represents the density of gas, which I've just circled. And we leave a part in that's the density of water. By definition, this term, gas over water, is this. So we could substitute into here H. So this term here ultimately becomes uppercase H with no prime, with no prime attached to it. So this is, the, and so if that's the case, then that's this. Right. And so the bottom line is, if you want to get this non-dimensional gas co coefficient, look up the value of the Henry's Law coefficient for that compound in the textbook, 
know what the universal gas constant is, which is this. And know what the temperature is. 20 degrees centigrade is 293 Kelvin. Almost absolute. Right. Let me make that bigger to see if it gets, yeah, it does. I don't know why it blocks it out. So that's it. So I guess, all, so the only thing that you need to remember from this argument is that to get H, you can do this. That's, that's really. The rest is just proving to you that that's real. Okay. And the reason we like to know what H is is because it gives us this, which is very useful to us. And this is parallel to distribution coefficient KD, and we use it in retardation. Okay. And so there's a little calculation there to do that. We should keep on moving. I won't talk about that. I won't talk about that. It just makes the case that these things are all... Yeah, it makes the cases that concentrations come in different, different magnitudes. Um, yeah. <coughs> the other thing that we I'd like to talk about, so if we go fair way back here. Our introductory discussion was this. And so what we've done is we have basically made a case for this. We've talked about retardation in the gas phase. We've talked about if it goes into the liquid and gets diffused in here, then we can calculate the arrival times here. Uh, that's fine. So we've, we've done that to death. And we understand hopefully something about that. We said before that the larger mechanism by which it can be transported is by being born in water. And so let's look at that now. And so now we can look at how this would behave. And uh, we'd like to be able to say something about how rainwater, if it infiltrates in here, would carry it down to the, bathe, to the water table. And then once it's in the water table, it can be carried away. So let's make a break with what we've talked about so far in the Vedo zone. And now we're talking about transport in the Vedo zone, but not by gas. Transport the Vedo zone by water. And so if you took a snapshot of this water saturation profile at a given time, and if you come back in a month's time and you take another snapshot and say the saturation profile looked the same, say a little bit like this idea, right? So this is the water saturation with depth. Not very much at the top, more water saturation at the bottom as we go into the groundwater table. But if every time you took a picture of this saturation profile with depth, it looked the same, then the saturation profile isn't changing. So if you input groundwater, sorry, surface water at the top that goes in here, then what it's doing is it's, if it's not changing the saturation of this, then it's flowing down through the moisture that's already in there, right? The water comes at the top, it goes into the soil, it goes into the water that's already there, and it pushes the water that was sitting in the pore down to the next pore, which pushes the one next to the pore, etc. And so this train, if you like, push when it goes into the top, pushes out stuff at the bottom, which has already been sitting at the bottom. Which is one way of saying that if the saturation profile is always the same within here, you can think of the infiltration that comes in here only being carried within the liquid saturated portion of the porous medium, which is there. Not filling up the void space of the air to make it different, but just keeping the, the water saturated part the same. And if we make that assumption, it makes this calculation that we'd like to do to figure out how much stuff will go down from the water table to, to the water table a very straightforward one. And so that's what we'll do here. So that's where we're going. So. Isn't your bladder not supposed to hold anything when you get old? Not when you're young? I don't want ladies go out. Jeez, no guys. Um, all right. This is the idea. So this, well, I'm going to, I guess we do have to. So this is, so we can talk now about transport in the system due to being carried in the water. So this is a basic idea. Water comes in through the top. 
washes down through here, goes through the water saturated part, dissolves a portion of this, keeps on going and shunts this portion, carrying the contaminant down to the water table, sits in the water table and then gets, because it comes in as dissolved species, gets carried away. So that's the calculation. What is the uh, advective, the rate at which this goes into the subsurface? So the rate at which it goes into the subsurface is going to be the advective velocity. You can't see that. And it's going to be the Darcy velocity. This is the same as the Darcy velocity, what we've called Darcy, which is really the infiltration rate. Yeah. You have one inch an hour infiltration on the surface. That's the same as a velocity, right? So length over time. So infiltration, so the amount that goes into the ground, if it's an inch an hour, and only half it goes in, into the ground, then it's 0.5 of an inch per hour. But it's basically the same as a Darcy velocity because it's being supplied across the whole surface. If it only travels through the portion of the porous medium, which is water saturated, which is the volumetric moisture content, if it's 100% saturated, it would be the porosity, and this would be N. If it's only partly saturated, it would be the volu volumetric moisture content. So this is volumetric moisture content. If it's 100% saturated, it'd be porosity. So this is the advective velocity, no different from the advective velocity that we talked about before. So if you know the infiltration rate, it's kind of a Darcy velocity. Because it only goes through the, through the water saturated part, it gets squeezed through a much smaller part than the whole porous, but than the whole surface, uh, a much smaller part even than the porosity, because it only partly fills the porosity. So it goes much faster than infiltration. One inch, one inch uh, an hour as it comes in, if the volumetric moisture content is 10%, it goes at 10 inches an hour. I know I should be, should be talking in S. So that's basically this. So that determines how quickly it goes down here. So that, if you like, is the, you can think of this as the advective velocity of the amount that's held in water. So in other words, and of course, as soon as it starts raining here, it will displace the amount that's already sitting here to the water table. So it only has to travel this far because it's already got water dissolved in it. And this stuff is just displacing the stuff, which displaces the stuff below that, which displaces the stuff below. So it's like a shunting train. So that's the, the time it takes to, to arrive at the water table. You could calculate from that in the same way we've always done it, in that it is equal to... Velocity is equal to length over time. So time is equal to length over velocity. So we can do that. But the mass road loading rate at which this gets carried down, not the velocity, not the advective of velocity, but the mass loading rate that it arrives here is really controlled by the Darcy velocity. It's not a speed thing, uh, but it's a Darcy velocity. And so, in other words, if you want to know the mass flux, then it is equal to the Darcy flux, which is um, well, the advective velocity multiplied by this rate. So actually, it's the, if you take the advective velocity and multiply it by this, you get the infiltration. So this is actually infiltration rate. which is exactly the same as the Darcy velocity. And if you multiply the Darcy velocity by whatever the concentration is in that water, that gives you the mass loading of the solvent. So this is what, in other courses, we might call a mass rate. Not a mass rate of water, but a mass rate of TC, dissolved in water. And so it's important to make that distinction. I kind of belabored the point, but uh, it's worthwhile belaboring. The velocity it gets carried at is the advective velocity, and that velocity is much faster than the Darcy velocity because it only goes through the water-filled part of the connection, the connected water-filled part. But the mass loading rate that it goes at uh, is given by the Darcy Darcy velocity. If we wanted to uh, develop a differential equation that 
govern this advection diffusion in the Vedos zone then it would be what we've had before which is everything on the left of this line plus a portion that represents this advective velocity going down but we're not going to use that because we don't because I don't want you to <laughs> But that would be the equation that you might use. What we're going to do the back, of the you know, the proverbial back of the envelope calculation, and you recognize this, right? This is just diffusion dispersion part of gas. This is the amount that's carried away uh, in the water phase uh, from the gas concentration, and this is the rate at which it accumulates somewhere else, uh, deeper in the medium. It's all written in terms of the gas concentration, uh, and so uh, this is the amount by which it's depleted. But what we're just going to do is just a simple calculation based on the two more important concepts above. And again, I, well, I'll, I'll repeat here that it goes down through here, uh, through the connected water, water phase. The velocity is the advective velocity, but the mass loading is given by the Darcy velocity. So example, this is an experiment that was done at Borden, the site for which we had these uh, dispersive clouds that were moving down gradient from which we could calculate dispersion coefficient. And what they did was they dug a hole, uh, they backfilled that hole with um, the sand that came out of the hole but also mixed with TCE at some very low residual saturation, maybe one liter of TCE in a, in a relatively big block, which represented a saturation uh, or a, a a volume of TCE per volume of the soil or the aquifer of 16 liters per cubic meters, I guess it'd be per aquifer. And so it's a relatively low concentration. And they left it there and they let it rain on it. And they looked at what happened to it. Just like the experiment we talked about in Oregon, but this happened to be in Borden, which is in southern Ontario, in a, a sand aquifer. And they measured the concentrations that hit the water table which was two and a half meters below this, and I think this was two and a half meters below the ground surface, I think. On this. And we just did those two calculations. So question number one, how long does it take to arrive here if you know what the infiltration rate is? So if you know what the infiltration rate is on the surface, half a meter a year is 18 inches a year, basically which is probably, as an infiltration rate, would be the same rainfall here. We probably get um, a meter or so of rain a year, I would think, around here. And this is, if you cut off the amount of runoff on the surface and put whatever goes in the ground, this is what goes into the ground. If the volumetric moisture content in the Vado zone is 10%, 0.1, then it means it goes 10 times faster than infiltration, 4.5 meters a year. If it has to travel two and a half meters, because remember, the stuff that comes in here merely displaces the stuff that's already sitting here, which goes here, which displaces the stuff that was sitting here, etc. So it's just this t -t -t -t, the, the, the first train car hitting the others and moving them along, which means that as soon as it's time zero, it gets pushed out of here and it goes a certain distance. So it really only has to travel 2.5 meters. So the time it takes to travel 2.5 meters at four and a half meters a year, or five meters a year, is half a year. You can do, do the calculation. So what's the mass loading as it comes out of the, the bottom here? To do that, then we need the volumetric flow rate. So this is what we've, in other cases, called Q, which is the same as we call here Q infiltration, INF, this here. This is the Darcy flux, actually velocity, I guess, Q over, yeah, Q over A. This is the mass loading per unit, per meter of aquifer, right? Per meter in plan view. So this is the mass loading per meter, I guess it says here. One meter per year is one meter cubed of infiltration per meter squared. So 
this is volumetric moisture content, 10%. This is 4.5 meters per year, which is the advective velocity. Together, if you multiply these together, this should be 0 0.45 meters a year, which indeed is our infiltration amount, right? This is our infiltration velocity. And this is the maximum solubility of TCE in water. So 1,100 uh, milligrams per liter. Multiply them together, you get uh, half a kilogram per year, per square meter. It's not really a one-dimensional problem because this is finite, but if you imagine that this existed for infinity, then or if you knew what the footprint of this, so if you knew if the area looking down on this was one meter, then this would actually be the loading per year from the source. If it was over 10 square meters, 10 times that. I know you can do that math. So that's how to do it. And so that allows us to be able to figure out. And you remember before, you know, we're talking about having inputs to the advection dispersion equation for this stuff being carried downstream in the in the saturated groundwater zone, this is something that we can use as this boundary condition to be able to calculate that. Okay, well, we're almost done. So the last thing I wanted to do is, if we wanted to be something much more sophisticated to look at this, then we could use a numerical model that would include this as loading and also uh, and allow transport in the Vado zone. And I think this is this last little part. And it basically takes the same geometry and information as we had before of this particular experiment, which by the way is done at Borden because somewhere below this um, system is a clay layer which acts as an aqui-clued so that the stuff that gets dissolved here and then gets carried downstream doesn't mess up people's groundwater elsewhere. So it is quite well contained. And if you do this in some kind of model that represents this behavior, then you can just look at this in a much more sophisticated way. So the same uh, moisture and gas contents, the same rainfall, same geometry, uh, Borden fraction of organic carbon, so not very much retardation, ex or sorry, not much retardation on the um, organic stuff, of which there's not very much but maybe some on the grain surfaces. Magnitudes for uh, gaseous, free gaseous diffusion coefficient, 10 to the minus 6. Non-dimensional Henry's law coefficient. Organic carbon partition coefficient, although we said that using that to calculate the sorption in the aquifer would probably underestimate real KD, right? Because there's not very much organic carbon. We probably shouldn't be using that. And same geometries. And so this is just looking at this behavior uh, at two different uh, times. I'm looking to see what the times are. Can anyone see? Oh yeah, down here. The top ones are after half a year and the bottom ones are after a year. So early time, late time, same geometry, this is the source in each of these cases. These are the transport of, um, these are the concentrations that are in the gas phase as it moves away from here over time. And so you see that after a year, it's gone maybe a bit further for this contour than it did after six months. And likewise, in this one, it's gone a bit further after a year than six months. The, the dotted lines and the, the dashed lines and the dotted lines, I think, well, not I think, relate to the, the gas diffusion behaviors for these cases. Um, yeah, all that's different between the left is that this is uncovered and this is covered. Um, I don't actually can't think what the difference between the dotted lines are. It doesn't matter because they don't make any substantial difference. And so the left right hand one is covered, and the one left hand, left hand one is not. 
And so you see that depending on whether it's covered or not covered, well, if it's not covered, if it's covered, then it's gone a bit less far. No, a bit further, maybe. This here looks like it's gone a bit further than this one, yeah, maybe. And so there's some difference in that. But the most important thing is that because in this case you've covered it with a geomembrane, and therefore by definition there is no infiltration here, which is washing through this <coughs> and washing it down to the groundwater table. If you look at the mass loadings on the water table, here it's six kilograms after six months, and here it's less than 10% of that, probably 5% of that. As time goes on, it's 15.8 kilograms after a year. And in this case, it's 20% of that. So the question is, well, not a question. Yeah. Why after six months and a year, why isn't this just double? So you think if you ran it for six months and you load it by six kilograms coming down here, if you do it for another six months, then it would be six plus six. What from what we've talked about today means rationalizes that that's not the case. No one going to, yeah, Carl. Uh, the horizontal fusion would allow a greater surface area to be exposed to the infiltration? Could, could be. Um, um, by the yeah, could be. So it could, yeah. So I can imagine that, so in, that, in other words, going down here, yeah, but you expect it as you go down here, then it's going to make some geometry, the plume, and that plume is going to be kind of in steady state, and it's going to keep on repeating. So, I, yeah, it could be that it does that. I think, I'm guessing that the reason is for the idea that we talked about, that from this one, when you start from zero, there's nothing that's here. So for it to go from here down to the water table takes some amount of time, which in our case was, well, it was half a year. So I presume it's going a bit faster than that here, but because it's get that, it already has stuff after six months. So I think it's the fact that this one, when it starts from zero, it physically has to get by advection to get here. Once it's got here, after six months, then it's, uh, can, it's delivering stuff through all of the six months rather than just through six months minus the time it took to get there. I think that's it. But I think, yeah, dispersion could contribute that to some amount. But I think the, the major effect is this. Did you think you should go because just because you run out of time? Is that what you're getting ready for, mate? <laughs> that's all. That's all I got. That's all I got. And so, put in context. This is part of three parts. How it gets to its place, gravity, and meniscus forces control that. How it moves in a saturated zone uh, is then controlled by multiphase flow. That's what the architecture is that it works on. Once it's in that architecture, it gets carried downstream in the saturated zone. We know how to do that. Also, in the Vado zone, it is mobile as well by these different transportation mechanisms, and now we know how to do that. So we've covered all the parts in terms of the physics of what's going on in the subsurface. I guess we'll talk a little bit about modeling. We'll talk a lot about site investigation, and we'll talk. you'll talk about remediation. That's it.